that $10 million per Bitcoin number is in today's dollars. There's a greater likelihood for this cycle to be bigger than the prior cycle. I've been expecting 150 to 250, but I wouldn't be surprised if we go to 350. Bitcoin grows from being one one thousandth of the world's assets to 20% of the world's assets, which is a 200x gain in relative to the other asset that removes the dollar measuring stick issue and says that that's real growth of 200x as people learn more about the asset people are shifting from a speculating stance with bitcoin to a i'm going to put this in cold storage and hold it for generations because it's so valuable Uh, we, we talked about it before we had Sailor on the show and he talked about the 10 million uh, dollar case and we have talked about that uh, you are basically behind those numbers I mean he is also like when when he's putting the slides up he always like has your Twitter handle and everything like that uh, so there is no no secret about that but before we get into the the full potential of Bitcoin and where we go I found also an article of you before the cycle started where you basically said this cycle will be different this cycle will be bigger because the uh, basically the before cycle was a b little bit dampened and now that this cycle you expect a little bit uh, more do you still believe that and what do you mean with with bigger yeah good good uh topic interesting to revisit that um yeah that was about a year ago and and I, 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 I will say, it's, I specifically said, I think uh, it's, there's a greater likelihood for this cycle to be bigger than the prior cycle than, than we've had in any earlier um, cycle. So I, basically, and, and, and then I dug into the analysis of, uh, I, I think that, you know, the last cycle was muted for a variety of reasons. I think we would have gotten a blow off top to the you know hundred to hundred fifty thousand dollar per bitcoin range but but we didn't for several reasons one being the china mining ban kind of throwing a wrench in the in the development of that um exponential blow off top um you know in 2021 that caused the summer dip that we then had to like re rebound from um the other big thing being the FTX um, and other rehypothecation blowing up that actually creates a little bit of a, a positive um, momentum on the on you know on the front side of those blowing up. However, they were using FTX in particular was using Bitcoin that uh, its customers thought they were buying and holding and secretly selling that Bitcoin to buy altcoins that they were trying to prop up and, and speculate on. So that was actually um, bearish for that was that was hurting the Bitcoin price because they were selling Bitcoin, even though the customers thought that, you know, that they were still holding Bitcoin. And that's what it was showing in their accounts. So that was another thing. But then probably the biggest one was the the Fed switching from um, from our lowest lynch, low interest rate environment to suddenly starting to hike interest rates, um, and that was kind of like a you know a cold a cold wind suddenly turning on uh, for all markets, but most of all for crypto, um, just kind of killing the speculative momentum that was developing at that point in time. So all that to say that you know I think we didn't go as high as we would have um, had the, either any of those three things not happened. Um, as a result of that, I think that we are a bit of a compressed spring right now where there's, we probably should have gone higher than we did. Um, and the market thinks that the fair value of Bitcoin at this point in time is, is lower than the actual uh, fundamentals I think will, will reveal, um, because you know the, the market sort of gets in this natural um, tendency to say, okay, here was the top. Now, what what's a seventy five percent drawdown for Bitcoin from there? Okay, this is kind of the range that we should be in, somewhere in the middle of, right? But if the top is seventy k, that the middle of that range is thirty five or forty or something like that. Um, but if the top was one hundred and fifty k, the middle of the range is is seventy k or you know something like that. Um, and so in some ways, I think that's kind of what happened uh, first quarter of this year is Bitcoin was unusually low. Um, you know, we probably it, it was 
it was uh, unusual for us to go below the prior um, the prior cycle high. You know, so when we when the FTX crash took us down to fifteen, sixteen thousand, that was below the twenty thousand from the December twenty seventeen peak. That had never happened before, and I think that's part of the sort of suppression of of Bitcoin that was a, was downstream of those three things happening um, in the twenty twenty one bull market. Anyway, as as a result of that, I think we are lower than we than we um, sh- quote unquote should be, and you can make the case then that that as this bull market plays out, there will be just a bit more tailwind um, because the fundamentals will kind of bear out and will end up going higher and sort of making up some of the ground that we should have gotten four four years ago. Um, and that's, I could see that playing out. It's sort of like a 35, 45% chance, you know, which, which is to say that I don't think it's my base case, but I think it's, um, I think there's a good argument that that's what we'll see. That is interesting. I mean, uh, the, the shorter term, the, the harder it gets to <laughs> predict any prices. Yeah. Uh, and I heard anything from like 100K to a million. I think like under 100K will be hard for, for, for the top of, uh, of, of Bitcoin to be and over a million will be also really hard <laughs> to, yeah, to, agree. To, to, to be. Um, where do you see like if, if you had to put a guess in, uh, in, in some range for, for, for next year, year, where would you do it? Yeah, great question. Um, <clears throat> it it's really interesting right now because it, it it's easier for it's frankly easier to make predictions uh, a year ago than it is now because as we start the closer we get to the actual post having bull market, uh, you know, manifesting, um, the harder it, it gets to say what's going to happen because you know when you're further out you can you can speak in generalities a little bit more easily um and then you know the closer you get the more precision people expect but like we still don't really have any greater um uh, ability to forecast the near term than you know that's always the case in, in bitcoin um so i've so I, i've sort of been expecting like a 150 to 250 and that's been my expectation for the last few years um, for the for this market cycle. Now I don't know if that'll be twelve months post having or eighteen months post having. I think somewhere in that range. Um, last bull market, we we got the uh, enthusiasm peak for the cycle uh, eleven months post having actually. Um, so you know we had the having in spring twenty twenty, and then we actually had our, our peak m- mania. Um, in, in spring 2021, right before the China mining ban cut it short. So you, you kind of don't know what would have happened or how long that mania would have extended. But you know, as, it, as it played out, we, we had 11 months from having to peak enthusiasm. Of course, we ended up in November, uh, I think November, maybe late October, setting a, a slightly higher high, but there was not as much like new interest um, from people who you know, weren't in crypto. Um, so I, anyway, I don't know if, if we'll have a peak of 12 months post having, which would be Q2 this next year or 18 months post having, which would be the end of the year, which is what we, we have, have had in most cycles, but not really in last cycle. Um, yeah. yeah. And so 150 to 250, however, the, the, I wasn't really expecting the ETFs to, to happen. Um, you know, like a, a year ago, I, well, a year ago it started to be the hints were there as, as some of the SEC guidance started to make that evident that they were playing ball. Um, but before that, it, it has always, always felt like that would never happen. Then the ETFs did arrive. And, um, I think we saw in, in Q1, um, what that looks like, what that does, because there was a lot of excitement, um, a lot of inflows via the ETFs, inflows much greater than the um, daily Bitcoin issuance from mining. So, you know, some trading days we were seeing ETF demand uh, that was 10x the current block is- uh, Bitcoin issuance from mining. 
um, which is incredible from a su supply demand point of view. And whenever we have those kind of conditions, we're, the, the price is going to just rip. Um, so it, it's now an open question of will, the, will that kind of ETF frenzy return um, once the price of Bitcoin starts to run? And I think the answer is yes, it will. I think, I think the ETF buyers are like anybody in Bitcoin. Uh, they respond to reflexivity. Uh, when the price is running, there's more demand. Um, because people take interest and, and pile in. So I think we're probably going to see that again. And if we do, we could see, you know, 300, 350. So, you know, we'll see what, how it plays out. But I'm, I'm still sort of anchoring to like 150, maybe 250. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if we go to 350, um, if the ETFs r run really hot and everything gets really, really exciting. Uh, I don't. I don't think it could possibly go higher than that this cycle. So you know the the one million expectations that people are putting out there. I think I think there are simply too many OG Bitcoin whales who would be more than happy to offload a ton of Sats at 500k. You know. Yeah, I think the sale pressure gets just like too high if we cross like a half, half a million or something like that in like next year. That would be crazy. Uh, even for non OGs that maybe have been entering in like 2021 or, or in 2020, that's not that far away. It's like, like four years. M next year is like five years. So imagine in 2020, you could pick up like a Bitcoin for 3,000. Then five years later, it's a million. Right. That would be, that would be really crazy and would give in a lot of incentives to, to put in sell pressure, even with 300,000. But like with a million, it's, <laughs> it's way yeah. more crazy on that. Completely agree. That, that's a great way to think about it. Like all those coins that bought at 3K, would, it would be foolish not to, to at least sell half your stack. You know, if, you, if you're just like a, a casual Bitcoin speculator who is like, well, look at this. I, I, just, I just made a, a 100x plus in a few years. I'm going to cash out some of it. Absolutely. And it's also interesting, um, two things that I want to ha highlight. You said the first thing already, the ETFs uh, that came in January, so like right before the, the this, this new cycle starts. And also we hit the all-time high uh, before uh, the, the the halving, which uh, I think never happened before. Yeah, that's right. Uh, which is uh, really interesting. Maybe also, as you said, because the previous cycle was kind of dampened. Uh, so that that's like two two interesting points that I look in like oh it's it's like maybe this this next cycle is different but I guess every cycle like before every cycle is always this rumors like oh is this cycle different will we yeah. end in now a gold rush era or is that cycle thing breaking is that something that you're looking at like this this cycle is that psychology like so ingrained in us that it will never break because like from a uh, new mining supply uh, stands, like the cycle gets less and less important, I guess. Uh, but w will it break at, at some point or will it break like to the upside, downside? Uh, what do you expect here? Yeah, that's a, that's a big question. Um, yeah, I do think about this a lot. And I don't, I don't really have like, I don't feel, feel like I have that one figured out. I think we'll all kind of find out together. Um, I do think that, there is, I think there's a misconception about the impact of the halving because it, it is true that it, the impact of the halving gets less and less relative to the existing circulating supply. Um, and so th then I think people see that and they go, well, the halving's not going to matter um, eventually. But if you think about it from the, from the net inflows point of view, so thinking about it from what dollars have to flow into Bitcoin to, um, well, well, let's work through the numbers. So right before the halving, uh, the price was at 70K. Uh, we had been mining um, $1.8 billion of new Bitcoin per month. Every single month, $1.8 billion of new Bitcoin just appearing. Uh, and that, for the price of a Bitcoin to go sideways, you need $1.8 billion of net inflowing capital coming in to absorb that that's that's so that's the definition of the price going sideways right all else equal holders not not selling that's that's what you need <clears throat> and that's what we were seeing uh right around the halving 
So, you know, we have to assume, you know, all else equal that it was roughly $1.8 billion of, of net inflow and capital. Then the halving happens and suddenly we're mining half as much Bitcoin. And so that 1.8 billion per month drops to 900 million per month. And suddenly you only need $900 million of, of net inflow and capital every month in order for the, the price of Bitcoin to go sideways at 70K. But you're ostensibly not going to, uh, that's, you know, there's no reason for the net inflow and capital to also drop when the halving happens. So ostensibly you'd have $1.8 billion of, of net inflow and capital coming in, only 900 million of new Bitcoin being created. So now there's a $900 million gap. And I think that is the, that's the core mechanic of what causes the post having um, Bitcoin, Bitcoin bull markets is that $900 million uh, accumulating uh, month after month after month after month. And you, you basically, the, the people coming into the market have to go find more supply because there's not enough being created for mining for them. So they go bid, you know, they, t- they take it up from available for sale supply um, on exchanges and they put in cold storage and, and that chips, that chips away, that eats through available for sale supply until suddenly there's not much that people are willing to sell. And then the price starts to, it has to go up as bidders try to find more supply. They have to raise their bids and you start to see this um, slow parabolic advance develop. So that's the, like the, the net inflows perspective on the having. And what's interesting about that is that that is always true. So, you know, if the, if the price of Bitcoin, was to 10 X. Um, and you know, so let's say, yeah, price of Bitcoin 10 X is we, and then we, we are going into you know, the next having, I don't expect this, these numbers, but it was easier this way. Um, at, at now we're doing 9 billion, we're, we're mining $9 billion per month and Bitcoin has, has grown as an asset and there's more demand for it. And that $9 billion is offset by in net inflowing demand. So the price is going sideways going into the next halving. And then the halving happens and suddenly there's $4.5 billion of, of Bitcoin being created, but still $9 billion of net inf- inflowing demand. That, that four, $4.5 billion of, of gap is what is going to generate the supply shortage um, that accumulates that causes the, that uh, post having Bitcoin bull market. So, from the perspective of of net inflows, the the diminishing size of the of the having's impact um, doesn't matter so long as the, the 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 mechanics there are still happening and the dollar the dollar gap between between Bitcoin mining and net inflowing supply continues to chip away at available for sale supply. Granted, there, one other big uh, assumption in there is that um, you, I guess you need to have available for sale supply shrinking over time um, in order for those mechanics to continue to cause like a, an acute shortage as the, they chip away at available for sale supply. So like, you know, if you always had 10% of Bitcoin available for sale, um, it would be hard for the post having um, supply shortage to accumulate enough to cause like an, an acute uh, uh, price run. Um, you know, as the size of that impact gets smaller over, or, you know, two x smaller every every having. Um, but I think that I think that the that will not happen because I think as people learn more about the asset um people are shifting from a from a speculating sort of stance with bitcoin to a uh, i'm gonna put this in cold storage and hold it for generations because it's so valuable and and you know i think we're we're seeing like a, a shift on that and i think we're seeing that on chain too the i think right now the amount of bitcoin that hasn't moved in over a year is is um at an all-time high, so I think that trend continues, and that's part of the story here. Sorry, that was a that, I went in, I went in quite a meandering uh, a route there, but uh, but hopefully that was interesting.
Uh, that was interesting. It's really um, because I never looked at that with, with the new inflows and then seeing what the Bitcoin price is and then we have to match that. I mean, there's also like a lot of other factors that come into play here, but it's it's really interesting to, to look at uh, it in that way. Now let's go um, a little bit deeper in the full potential because it's 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 fun to <laughs> talk about uh, short term, uh, but uh, <laughs> most Bitcoiners that watch my podcast on a very regular basis, they probably won't sell anyway <laughs> the next five, five ten years. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it's always fun for me to talk about where is Bitcoin going in like 10, 20, 30, 50 years, uh, depending on what your outlook is. Like obviously mine is very far out because I'm 25, so... I, I would love a Bitcoin to be back at like 15K, honestly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like yeah. the, the cheaper it gets, the better it for me. Um, I need the Bitcoin price to be high in like 20, 30 years and not like tomorrow. Um, so uh, that, that's what, what, what my perspective on that is. So what is the, the, the full... Uh, and it's, re- it's always a really interesting this question because the full potential, we always have to value it in, in something. Uh, and when you value it in dollars, we have to, have to assume like we value it in today's dollar terms. So if we have like inflation or like a hyperinflation scenario in the like next like 20, 50 years, which could happen, um, then like obviously those numbers are completely off and they're like, oh, like in 2024, someone predicted a $10 million Bitcoin. Now it's like, oh, dollar is not there anymore. <laughs> So yeah. uh, that, that's always interesting to see. Uh, so I'm first interested in the full potential of Bitcoin in, in dollar terms, but then also maybe diving into comparison to maybe gold, uh, like how much kilograms of gold can you buy with one Bitcoin? Uh, what, what's the average home price in Bitcoin in like 20, 30 years? Because that's like really tangible goods that will not go away. Dollar can go away. But right now the unit of account is dollar, so I think it's fair to to take dollar as as like a measurement tool because most people use it as that. So you put out ten million. Um, how do you get there? And it's is still is this still the case one year later with the inflation? Yeah, um, yeah, great, great setup there. That uh, yeah, that 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 question that you have is was sort of the starting point for me for for doing this. Uh, Bitcoin's full potential valuation um, analysis and article that that made a bit of a splash. Um, you know, as you alluded to earlier, Michael Saylor's uh, Michael Saylor loved it uh, and has been using the, the the numbers from it, the the graph, and the, and then the framework too as part of his recent analysis over the last year. It's kind of you, you've if you've seen a Michael Saylor presentation in the last year, you've seen um, parts of this analysis. Um. So for me, I, I guess a little bit of background. I I was a management consultant before getting into Bitcoin, um, and one analytical tool or exercise that you use in, as a as a management consultant is uh, the full potential of X, um, and, and it's usually in terms of like what if our client, a, you know, a big company, was to start selling in Asia, you know, what's the full potential of market share we could get and profits we could get from that? That's usually the the, the scope and, and nature of of how this exercise is done. So I'm so I'm familiar with doing that, and, and it involves you know pulling together various pieces to triangulate a a, a, a realistic um, set of assumptions of what could happen or, you know, what's the start, what's the starting point and then what could happen over time based on various assumptions that, you know, you kind of pressure test and it makes you ballpark it and, and you get a, a rough idea of, of how things could go. So with Bitcoin, I, that's been part of how I've thought about it from the start and a big part of um, <clears throat> why I did this analysis was, was because I, realized that you know i like you i've recognized that the the dollar uh, measuring stick doesn't make sense uh, you know as you project forward into time so it doesn't really make any sense to say that the price of bitcoin will be a million dollars or even 10 million dollars um in the future because who knows what a dollar's worth um so the thing that i wanted to do and and i think this is probably the 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 bit of innovation, I guess, that I brought to um, 
this analysis was to level set everything in terms of percent of the existing assets in the world. So that way you can, you know, it doesn't matter what a dollar is worth. You're, you're basing it based off of what's Bitcoin's percent uh, value in the, um, among the total asset value in the world. Um, and, and that's more informative. So the, the starting point of that is to figure out, well, how many assets are there in the world? Uh, and, and funny enough that that was hard. That was kind of the, the thing that was missing that I had to, you know, do some, some analysis to figure out what are the various buckets and how do I triangulate the right size for these buckets to say how much value sits in, in bonds, how much value sits in real estate, how many, how, how much fiat money is there, how much, uh, values in global equities markets, that's, that's stock markets, but also private equity. Um, and there's collectibles, there's, there's cars and other vehicles, there's, uh, there's gold. Um, and, and then there's Bitcoin. I did, uh, I did ignore, uh, derivatives because I think the, uh, nominal value of derivative derivatives is quadrillions, but the settled, settled value of derivatives is, um, I think a, a few hundred billion. So uh, that's a red herring that people fall for. But anyway, the, when you sum up all the, the global asset value, the numbers that I was finding, the triangulating, getting, I think, good estimates for $900 trillion of global asset value. Uh, and that, that was a year ago. So I, it's, it's, I haven't updated the analysis. It's, we're probably close to a quadrillion now. Again, these numbers are, are they are rough. Like I could be, I could be 30, 40% off with any particular bucket, but I think in aggregate, they're probably, they probably are roughly right. Um, anyway, so in that context, 900 trillion Bitcoin is currently 1 trillion. And so that is one one thousandth roughly of all the asset value in the world. So 0.1% of the, t of the global asset value has migrated to Bitcoin at this point in time. And then, and then the question from that point is what's the full potential for how much global asset value could migrate to Bitcoin or would be interested to migrate to Bitcoin over time? How much could Bitcoin eat from the global asset landscape? And, and that's anybody's, uh, anybody's bet, but now you have the right question, I think. Um, cause it doesn't matter in dollar terms, really what you're talking about. What matters is how you know what percentage of of global assets does Bitcoin become, and I think that you know so my, so from that point it's kind of necessary to stay conservative um, in in the numbers that I put out. But basically, I went through each of those uh, uh, asset buckets and estimated a percentage of the capital sitting in those buckets today that I think would be interested in being held in Bitcoin instead because of all Bitcoin's uh, benefits, advantages as a store of value asset, most notably that the fact that it has increasing scarcity terminating in absolute scarcity and no other asset class has that. So it's a better store of value from that point of view. Um, but also, you know, that you have no, um, no holding costs. Like, you know, if you're, if you're a, a landlord, your real estate is a pain in the ass to maintain and, and manage and you have all these headaches that go with that, or or you could take that money that's sitting in your incremental um, rental units and move it into Bitcoin and have no headaches holding that asset, and you're going to get a better return also because because of increasing scarcity and the fact that it nobody for the most part most of the world doesn't understand yet what it is. You know, I think we're going to get twenty five to fifty percent. Um, annualized growth and good luck getting that in any other asset. So it's a, it's literally a better asset than anything else in the, in the global asset landscape at this point. So I think a good chunk of real estate would be in, interested in sitting in Bitcoin instead. I think I, I use the number of 30% of the bond market would be interested in, in, in being in Bitcoin instead, because Bitcoin serves the uh, use case of bonds um, better than bonds do because the whole point of bonds is to get a small um, 
reliable yield uh, for tying up your money today. And that yield will slightly outpace inflation. That's, that's, the, that's the whole point of bonds. And the re- I think the reality of bonds right now is that the stated inflation is lower than actual inflation is. And that will continue, if not get worse into the future because of the current situation with the global sovereign debt and the need to print in order to stimulate the economy after 40 years of doing it. Um, so I think that we're, you know, bonds are going to deliver a, a yield below the inflation rate. So going forward and probably already currently, and th- that means that they are negative, a, 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 a negative proposition. You, you're losing value. You're, you're destroying value every year you hold money in bonds. And so, you know, what are you doing? <laughs> uh, that's not a good store value asset actually. Um, and there's $300 trillion sitting in there. In, in, in bonds today versus Bitcoin, which um, people think of as speculative and volatile. But Bitcoin, Pierre Richard likes to say this, I, I like this um, f- uh, framing. Bitcoin's not volatile. It, humans reacting to Bitcoin are volatile. Uh, and and that, that's true that, you know, you can rely on Bitcoin's increasing scarcity, its supply schedule playing out and the you know, all of the supply demand price um, phenomenon is downstream of that. And that will continue. And Bitcoin, I think it, it, I think it will continue to de- deliver at least 25% annualized returns, which makes it way better than bonds, despite it being, you know, the same sort of thing of like, you're, you're, you're tucking away money in an asset that will deliver some re- uh, reliable return. That, that that's actually Bitcoin. People just don't realize that. People think that it's the inverse. Um, anyway, so in my analysis, I, I, I pegged it as only 30% of bonds would be interested in, in migrating to Bitcoin. Uh, it could be much higher than that, right? Anyway, so you go down all the, the whole list of, of all the asset buckets and you put together some rough expectation of what uh, Bitcoin could eat from the existing allocations to different buckets and all, and I summed all that up and I got $200 trillion of, of Bitcoin's full potential valuation. And that amounts to 20, 20, 25% of, um, the, the existing global asset landscape. So we'll call it 20%. And that's the important number there is that I think that Bitcoin could be, could become 20% of the, the world's value. And a few a few points there. I partly made this analysis because the the meme of uh, infinity divided by twenty one million, um, I think is it it, it irks me. It, there's something wrong about it um, from a mathematical point of view. Like because you know infinity divided by twenty one million is uh, that is obviously infinity, but you, you're never going to have infinite purchasing power by holding one bitcoin. Your, your purchasing power is bounded by how many other Bitcoin there are, but also um, how much pur- purchasing power sits in Bitcoin as an asset relative to other existing asset classes. You know, your purchasing power of Bitcoin is whatever the exchange rate is for you know, an acre of land. You know, like there's always going to be some balance between people wanting to hold property, real estate, Monet paintings, you know, you're always going to have something like that. Um, anyway, so the, the full potential valuation kind of allowed me to arrive at a, at a, what I think is a conservative estimate for what Bitcoin could represent. And I didn't, I didn't set a date to it. I said decades, um, cause I specifically didn't want to, you know, put a date in, uh, out there, but you know, that could be, that could be 20 years. That could be 50 years. Um, but the important part is, is that if the logic in that analysis is true, then Bitcoin become, grows from being one one thousandth of the world's asset assets to twenty percent of the world's assets, which is a two hundred x gain in relative to other assets. So that's that you know that removes the dollar 
measuring stick issue and says that that's real growth of 200x relative to other assets that are out there. Um, and, and that one is, is a, a huge number um, and I hope happens. And I think it's actually conservative uh, in, the, in the grand scheme. Um, and it, it gets rid of the problem of, of like, what is a dollar? What, is, what does it mean? So that, that $10 million per Bitcoin number is in today's dollars. And I think that's an important thing that whenever people talk about, um, you know, the, the future dollar price of Bitcoin, like if they're talking about the, the dollar price in the future, it doesn't mean anything. If they're talking about it in today's dollars, it has meaning. Um, and, and that's, that's something that, that people often lose sight of. But anyway, so $10 million in today's dollars, several decades now, from now is the Bitcoin's full potential valuation granted a conservative full potential valuation if you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis i guess you already bought some bitcoin and now the most important step is to keep the bitcoin keep them secure in a hardware wallet my personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the bitbox it's super secure it's simple to set up it's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the bitcoin on an exchange and you can get a five percent discount with the code robin at the checkout visit bitbox.swiss slash robin to get your bitbox and if you really want to bulletproof your self custody setup your security setup and maybe even your citizenship set up you have to talk to the bitcoin way if you go to the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash robin you get a 30 minute free call where you can dive deep with them if your self-custody setup is secure if your citizenship is secure or maybe might be improvable or your digital footprint in general is secure they are the experts in cybersecurity, in Bitcoin self-custody, and how to be a secure, sovereign individual in general. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made a perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect perfect subtle elegant way to go out there and show that you are a bitcoiner and that watch brand is bitcoin only make sure to check out the link in the description for this amazing coin vigilante time pieces those watches are amazing i love them so much it was really hard for me to pick the one that i want to have because there are a lot of great options i went with the new transparency edition they are all limited so grab yours those will not be available for a long time but there will come new models and new amazing designs along the way yeah it's interesting for me because um like some of the percentages especially in bonds and, and other things uh they're for for me very conservative where like oh who, who wants to hold bonds i mean there could be bitcoin bonds uh, there could right. be something uh, instruments around that uh, but then it would also be in the bitcoin bucket and not in the bond bucket uh, really uh so that 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 could really quickly uh go in a whole different direction like when we uh, put like 20 percent with the conservative case but then there's maybe a pool case of i don't know 40 percent uh how much uh, is there like uh, so i hear some people saying like uh bitcoin is half of everything because it's money so that would mean like maybe 50 percent. like that's yeah. an interesting case yeah, that that's that, that's quite possible, um, and and that's a little bit of what Sailor uh, has sort of trotted out in his most recent um, presentation, which was excellent, uh, and and riffed on this starting point. Um, yeah, I think that's that's a quite a reasonable uh, prediction. Is that Bitcoin could eat half? Not so. I said twenty percent, and that, that was pretty conservative numbers. It could be fifty percent of the world's assets get consumed by Bitcoin, and and importantly, that that would mean a five hundred x from today relative to other asset classes um, for Bitcoin. So, you know that, and again, that removes that dollar measuring stick issue. But you know, think about it in those terms. Of like, 
if if we were to reach half of all assets um and i you know i think that's, that's actually probably more realistic than my numbers my numbers are sort of i think i think it's necessary to put out conservative numbers when you're when you're doing new analysis because um you don't want people to object to your estimates as unreasonable you want people to engage with the framework and you know when you have conservative numbers the framework is is what people focus on so yeah 50 percent. it seems logically more likely and that's pretty crazy so that would be what that that would be a f- boy a 50x from uh, uh, sorry, five hundred x from from today, so sixty k. Boy, where would that put us? At twelve? No, more than that. What would that be? I mean, if twenty percent are is that thirty uh, million? I think it's thirty million per Bitcoin in today's dollars. So, like twenty uh, percent uh, around then uh, are like a ten million. So, if you get to 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 the fifty million, that's around like thirty million. Where where because you said like sailor puts his numbers like he derives uh, his models from from your uh, uh, numbers where does he get his bull case for what was it 2045 with 49 million dollars uh, i think his bull case was 49 his base was 13 and the bear was like 3 million yeah um yeah he, they haven't re- released their model yet they they um they were saying they're they're going to um and yeah, his numbers are that his his analysis over the last year, and especially in the, the most recent uh, Nashville presentation, I, I think use my uh, my numbers as a starting point, um, and and also just use that that framework of how to think about what Bitcoin could be as as like a mental model that they're then adjusting the assumptions for, um, and that's how they ended up getting the the bear base and and bull case. One important difference with their model is that, um, so you know, he said he said twenty years in the future, so he specified a date, which is a good idea be, for, because it grounds people. Um, again, that's that's one of those like assumptions that you don't want to put out originally because uh, people could object to that assumption. But you know, sailor sailor can do it. Um, and the other piece in there is that it, the future state um, assumes four quadrillion in in global asset value, um, which is to say that everything will have forexed in price by then. So, I, so I think the assumption there, it, it there's sort of two possibilities there. You could you could argue that that means that global wealth has the, the world has gotten four times richer. Um, I don't think that's what Sailor in, intends there because I think he, uh, like me, views um, everything in in relative competition. Um, and so that the other alternative is that uh, everything is four four times more expensive. Um, basically, that the dollar has been debased four x, uh, and I think that's that's what he intends there. But so the so four quadrillion and then growing to um, what was the top number forty? It was 43 million? forty three million. Forty nine was the top number from million. from him. Yeah, and three million was the 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 bear case one. Yeah, right. Yeah. So so the interesting enough, you for all of those numbers, you have to divide by four to to get what that it would be in today's dollars, um, which is a little bit of sleight of hand, I think, which is great marketing um, on Sailor's part because people see the, the dollar number and it's, and it's bigger and that is exciting. Um, so the 49 would be 12 million in today's dollars. So that, that actually kind of lines up with my full potential valuation, $10 million number. Um, the other ones, and, and, and again, that was the bull case. And I, I suppose that sort of means, um, well, I, I know that what they did well, what I would have done, and I think what they probably did, is in the model they just have different um, annualized growth rates. Uh, I think if I was them, what I would do is the for, for the for, for the bull case start at fifty percent annualized growth, um, and then every year drop at one percent, 
uh, and see what that comes out to. I did, and, uh, and for the, the base case, start at 40% and drop it 1% every year, see what it comes out to. And for the bear case, start, start at 30 and drop it uh, 1% every year. And um, I did some, I did a, just a, on my phone, I, I calculated that what that would mean for the base case. And it came out to about 13 million. Um, so I think that's probably like roughly what they're, what they're working with in terms of how they got those numbers. Um, which, which is to say that it's, it's not, you know, there's, there's not a, any particular magic to it or, or any greater credence to those numbers than, than, than that. That's how you end up calculating numbers like these. Um, there's no magic to it. It's, it's just kind of reasonable assumptions and then seeing what the outputs are. So I have a feeling that's pretty much what they did. We'll see what they, if they release their model, what they actually did, but, um, that's my guess. Did you, as, uh, Michael Saylor used your models uh, a lot already, uh, Did he talk with you in deep? Like, did you have some some session with him where you <laughs> talked about about those models before he released that, or did he just use it? <laughs> Pretty much the latter. It, it's funny um, when I put out that article, he he retweeted it and uh, and and you know included a a comment in his tweet of like, you know, th this is an interesting analysis with some reasonable assumptions or like something very muted like that. Like he, he wasn't sticking his neck out. Uh, and he DM me saying this is very elegant work, which is, uh, you know, a great DM to receive on Twitter. Um, and, and th I thought that was that, uh, I thought that was, that was, all, you know, that was it. But then he did a presentation. I, I think that was in uh, Bitcoin Prague last spring <clears throat> And he started with that slide, <laughs> um, and and he's been using that in all of his presentations since, which has been uh, you know a tremendous honor, um, really cool to see, and uh, and yeah, I think um, it, it's I guess he sort of views Bitcoin the way I do, in, in terms of like that perspective is really helpful for grounding any any sort of talk about bitcoin is like this shows how early it still is it's one one thousandth of the world's assets 0.1 the, the globe collectively the world collectively has a 0.1 percent allocation to bitcoin right now that's how early it still is like so you know you and i can have a 50 plus percent allocation to bitcoin and we f and we know a lot of people who also have that And it feels like that community is large and Bitcoin is, you know, already uh, a big deal. Um, but the reality of it is that it's still a 0.1% allocation from a, from a, a worldwide capital allocation perspective. Um, so anyway, I, I, I think, you know, that's, that's what uh, Michael Saylor has been using as part of sort of framing his entire um, presentations the, the last year. So kind of starting and ending with that. Uh, which, which is also what I do when I, when I present any slides about Bitcoin. Um, and his most recent one sort of building, building on top of that, uh, analysis to, to come up with that, the, the bear base and, and bull case numbers that he's putting out, uh, putting out there really as like a nudge to, um, to individuals, but really corporate and nation state, uh, potential adopters. You know, to kind of anchor their thinking about what Bitcoin could be just 20 years from now, um, which I think is, I think is a seminal moment for, for Bitcoin analysis about like what, how does this asset fit into the global asset landscape? Um, we have kind of more precise numbers from a really credible uh, evangelist um, that, that everyone in the world is going to listen to and, and put some stock in. Uh, and I think that we will probably look back on, on that particular, the, the Bitcoin Nashville presentation as very consequential for accelerating corporate and nation state adop adoption of Bitcoin. I think so too. And, uh, there's like two points I want to cover. Like first, like, as you said, we're so early and 
sometimes in that Bitcoin circle, we forget how early we are because you get more and more Bitcoiners as friends and more and more of your friends get to be in Bitcoin. And then you say like, oh, they are all in Bitcoin. They have 50%. They already have, also have 10%. What's the potential? Then I <laughs> just invite everyone, go on the street <laughs> and ask some random questions about Bitcoin. Th then you really get a feeling how early we are. So like we, 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 we are not even at like, uh, we are not even at the starting point. Like we are, we are maybe sl slowly, slowly starting out. Like we have some co corporations in there. We have a nation state with El Salvador playing with it a little bit because even they have just five percent of their assets in bitcoin that that's not bold like 50 percent would be bold uh, but they also have to like slowly get that they cannot just like throw everything in bitcoin and then how many of the bitcoiners are actually over 10 percent of their net worth in bitcoin I, I think that's a very selective small uh, elite group that i actually have a high conviction about bitcoin uh, like I myself, I have, I think, 103 or 104 percent in Bitcoin. I'm working yeah, my way same. down. To, <laughs> I'm working my way down to 95. <laughs> yeah. As I'm having now my company and everything. But uh, like I, I'm completely in Bitcoin. But that's a very small select group of people uh, that is not large. Uh, and we should not forget as Bitcoiners, like, I think as as a human beings, we always have this concept of like, oh, I'm like that. So I assume a lot of other people are also yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this assumption is completely wrong if you're a Bitcoin. Um, that's, it's, it's more right if you're not a Bitcoiner. The other thing, uh, which is really interesting, I think the, the Bitcoin conference in Nashville, unfortunately, uh, I, I wasn't there, uh, but I wish I would have been there, was a very bullish one. Like uh, so many... Like the corporate interest there was amazing, and then and the political political interest was amazing. I mean, I loved RFK's speech; like he really yes. nailed everything that Bitcoiners want to hear, and that from a uh, presidential candidate. Trump's speech was for a lot of people disappointing. I actually liked it. Like I was like, "Hey, that's that's probably the next." Uh, pres president of the United States and he is talking that like you, you also have to put it in context like Trump cannot say the same things that RFK is saying like RFK can say it because he is a 1% chance of being the president he, uh, Trump has a over 50% chance that he's actually the next president so that like there's context to that uh, and uh, Michael Saylor um, putting out that so like in overall I, lo I love the conference actually and it was very bullish to see also like uh all those partnerships, like the small partnerships with like Bitcoin Magazine and MicroStrategy and all those things that going around uh, in the conference, the small announcements, small announcements of, of big companies uh, buying more and more Bitcoin. Like overall, we are really, I feel like in, a, in, the, in the most special era right now where the risk reward is so attractive, uh, where the risk is already very very low and the reward is still like we still have like 100 percent of the reward in front of us um that's that's just uh yeah amazing for me to see yeah totally um yeah i think we will i think we will look back on that conference as as a bit of a milestone for bitcoin's um progress into the mainstream um as a as a player on the global stage yeah it, it's true that that the the Trump speech was about as much as you could hope for, uh, realistically. Um, but you know there was a bit more hype beforehand about how there's going to be like a you know the million Bitcoin strategic reserve that that Trump never mentioned. Um, but you know that's fine that it, it's going in the right direction because because the prior year, you know, just one year ago, we had the Bitcoin Miami conference where RFK made his first speech about Bitcoin. And that was a huge deal because that was a, a, um, a presidential candidate porting the, the Bitcoin cohort for the first time and, and coming to Bitcoin's turf to talk, you know, to pander to Bitcoiners and, and Bitcoin, the Bitcoin industry in order to try to like generate um, enthusiasm for this this candidate, uh, that was a huge deal a year ago. And then just fast forward just one year and you could have the, the likely future president doing the same thing. 
that's that's uh, it kind of blows my mind like i thought that would happen four years later i thought it would take a full election cycle before the, the you know the the main um one of the you know, main political parties would take the rfk playbook from miami and and do the same thing and it was only one year later um i i did think the uh, the rfk uh, idea of sort of framing the the necessity of a um, of a national Bitcoin strategic reserve around the the context of what we have with gold already, you know, from from a U.S. perspective, um, that was actually a, a new a new thought to me. And I think a really important thing that's now been incepted out into the world um, that we could see mattering a ton uh, t- over the next 10 years. And, and that was that um, the U.S. has 19% of uh, global gold uh, stores. And that in the, in the implication in, in that, and what he talked about was that to match that sort of relative um, position that, that the U.S. enjoys with gold, the U.S. would have to, to stockpile 4 million Bitcoin. It, you know, if Bitcoin is going to become digital gold for the 21st century and the U.S. wants to maintain that relative uh, position, then that's what the U.S. has to do is, is accumulate 4 million Bitcoin. And I love that thought. I love that idea that that in, is that's been incepted now um, into the discourse about nation state adoption of Bitcoin of like, well, you should probably meet or exceed whatever percentage of the world's gold you have. Like, like that's your opportunity as a nation state. Like you have that opportunity at this moment in time to be a first mover in hoarding stockpiling and hoarding Bitcoin such that you could exceed your your relative position that you have today with with gold as a as the world's historical um, store of value um, neutral reserve asset and and so that could be huge that that could be fit, just a fantastic thing because we c- that could be the basis for a future um, uh, international competition to stockpile uh, Bitcoin in order to better uh, a, a, a country's relative position versus what they have been stuck with over you know, their, their history with gold. Because real, realistically, like, for example, like if, you are, if you're in the Middle East, if you're like Qatar, um, oil rich, but probably realistically late to the game in terms of stockpiling gold. You know, 6,000 years of history of gold and a lot of that stockpiling probably last happened in, uh, in you know, the monarch era of, uh, of Europe and, um, you know, the, the last 200 years really. But Qatar and a lot of the other uh, oil rich nations have only been rich for the last 50 years. Um, so they were late to the game and probably don't have as much of a, of a gold stockpile as they wish they had because that, all that gold's already accounted for, basically. But here's their, your opportunity now with digital gold, with gold for the 21st century to, you know, um, get a bigger slice of the pie than you have been stuck with in the, in the historical gold-based world. So I think that, that, I think that idea could be really big for um, setting these, like, these ambitious aspirations for sovereigns all over the world of like, I'm going to go and get mine. I'm going to, I'm going to accumulate a big chunk. And then that, you know, there's only 21 million and, uh, um, 20 million of that is already out there being held by Bitcoiners at this point. So good luck nation states. If you're going to, if you're going to get 4 million Bitcoin, you're going to have to bid it up big time in order to get Bitcoiners to part with their purchasing power. That, that was, I was going to ask because, um, like, like, first of all, I think, um, there's a, like a, a good number of Bitcoins lost, 
Mm-hmm. So uh, it's it's questionable if if the number is actually four million that the um, US needs. Maybe it's just like two and a half or three million uh, if you compare to the yeah, actual point. available uh, Bitcoin. And then four million is that even possible? Like if, if even if they are starting right, like even if Trump uh, is elected and he's like, oh yeah, four million, we need all the Bitcoin in our land. Uh, is that even possible because he, he has to do it somehow publicly that would trigger a massive game theory event where other nations are trying the same, where companies are trying the same, where individuals are all of the sudden trying the same. I don't know if uh, even three million or two and a half million, like uh, I've, I've, I didn't look that deep in that, but it's, it's, it's really hard for me to imagine that they actually could, <laughs> could pull four million Bitcoin uh, right now. Like they're not, so many available and the price would shoot up if, if they consistently buy Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, I think it's probably possible for, I think it's possible for one country that prints their own money, one G7 country that prints their own money um, to, to accumulate 4 million Bitcoin, uh, whichever one does it first basically and which and they would have to do it secretly um because you're right like it once you signal that to the world and you state your plan then everybody else would act accordingly um but i think it's you know to and also to get four million bitcoin to get the let's say 16 million bitcoin out there held held and not lost to get a quarter of that (laughs) Wow. Um, I think that that would be, that would require bidding Bitcoin up to a million dollars. Because I think that, you know, up there, you'd have a lot of OGs, a lot of Bitcoiners who bought at 3,000, who'd be happy to sell half their stack. You know, and I, I think you'd get enough, you'd get half of Bitcoiners would sell half their stack. And then there you go, you, you have one quarter. Of, of what's available. Um, so I think that's possible for one country to do. And, but once, once there's an international competition for that, um, nobody will be able to get 4 million on their own. Another interesting point um, I talked, I think tomorrow will be released the, the talk with me and CJK. And he's really big on Bitcoin being pristine collateral. Maybe those OGs don't have to sell. Uh, maybe they can just like 10% of their stack, they just like uh, lend out and with the appreciation, like I think also there are probably a lot of uh, interesting products coming out for Bitcoiners because uh, they, they want to do a lot of things. Like may- maybe those OGs are never forced to, to sell. They can just like <laughs> live in a really great life with 10% of their Bitcoin lending it out or doing something with, with that. How, how, do you, how do you look at that? Yeah, that's a great point that um, the advent of, uh, of, of lending products that are more <laughs> safe um, will will be interesting because people won't have to sell their Bitcoin. They'll just be borrowing against it. Um, I don't know how that how that'll play out. And uh, yeah, it, it does create an interesting dynamic where people theoretically won't have to sell their Bitcoin. They'll just be able to borrow dollars against it. I do think that uh, re- related to this topic, I, I think that that that'll I think the like hockey stick moment for Bitcoin uh, in the world world will be when when um, large pools of capital realize that they can borrow dollars for five percent and buy Bitcoin and watch that asset grow at twenty five to fifty percent per year and just do that. Um, I think the highest and best use of dollar debt is buying Bitcoin. And I think that once major capital pools realize this, then it's it's the end game for the transition from fiat money to, uh, to Bitcoin, to the Bitcoin standard, because people will do that all day long, you know, just... Um, borrow what dollars they can and and use those dollars to buy Bitcoin. Um, 
And you know, w- you know, once once that is set in motion, it's it's just a flywheel that will send Bitcoin very high and make it and make it a fixture, make it the preferred store of value. It, it, that that's how it really becomes like the world's money is once once the majority of or once it even even a twenty percent of the world's capital has decided this is the best thing they could, they could possibly be doing, um, then then it becomes you know, the new system. Um, so, and, and to get there, like before we're, we're able to do that, we have to have uh, more reliable lending products out there. Um, you know, Bitcoin underwriting needs to be better. You know, BlockFi and Celsius are examples of how it, it can go wrong. Uh, I think Unchained and BitGo are examples of how you can do it right. Um, basically over collateralizing a little bit more. And we're going to see more of that um, and, and those business models become more reliable. Uh, and then that market can and will take off, I think. Um, you know, the current cost of borrowing is 10, 15%. Um, and plus the risk that uh, this platform that you're trusting might turn into a block fire or Celsius, right? Like that, Like that's the cost of using you know deploying that that strategy of of borrowing against your bitcoin today um and that is uncomfortably high for me all right so like i'm not doing that today but if we get to a, a place where it's it's six percent and i have a high degree of confidence that that platform is not going to bust you know when there's a 75 percent drawdown for bitcoin um i'll do that all i will do that all day and so will other bitcoiners so we'll see I will be really interesting. Um, there's like one last question that I have uh, before we uh, close the, uh, the, the the podcast. Um, we, we talked a lot about like where we are adding, uh, where we could go, and also like the the current situation. Um, and now it's a little bit of future products. How do we transition to the full potential? Like when we are going to look at like the transitioning time, it's a long way till the Bitcoin's full adoption. We are not even at 100K and uh, 10 million is a, is, is a, a long way to there. Um, do you imagine, do you have anything like, do you have any bigger products, uh, financial instruments that on ramp more Bitcoin? Like the ETF was one big one. I hear more people talking about Bitcoin bonds. Um, is it just like we have built out everything now and those buckets will fill now? How do you see the transitioning time going to this full potential Bitcoin? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think it, it, it all stems from uh, Bitcoin supply mechanics, right? And those will keep increasing scarcity will keep playing out every four years, which will keep driving the price of Bitcoin higher. Um, and that will, you know, keep this tailwind for Bitcoin global Bitcoin adoption going because the, you know, the the single most important use case for Bitcoin is as a savings technology that grows your purchasing power over time because of increasing scarcity. Everybody in the world wants that. Every bit of capital wants wants that. They just don't know it yet. Um, so the, all that has to happen for Bitcoin to continue winning is for that to keep happening. However. Um, that continuing to happen will will keep um, developers and business people uh, engaged with Bitcoin, right? So they will continue to build solutions, build infrastructure, build business models that that are necessary infrastructure um, around Bitcoin's core value proposition of as savings technology. So you know that's what we're doing at um, at, at at OnRamp. I'm a co-founder of OnRamp, um, and we are a multi-institution custody platform, uh, which is a a the sort of next step in the evolution. We think in the evolution of uh, Bitcoin custody. So you know, for the last 15 years, people have had a choice between third-party custody, which basically means like leaving your coins on an exchange, like like Coinbase or Kraken or whatever. Um, third-party custody or self-custody, which early on meant, you know, having a um, a, a wallet.dat file in your computer uh, and then turned into um, 
uh, paper wallets and other things like that, and then turned into hard a single SIG hardware wallet, and then that turned into multi SIG collaborative custody, which is sort of where what the best in uh, best in class has been for the last handful of years. And um, multi institution custody is a variation on that um, that idea of setting up a multi SIG. Uh, so you know we are a, a, a service that helps an indiv- you know when an on- individual onboards with us, um, we set up a a um, multi sig multi institution custody vault for that client, which means that you know it's a two hundred three multi sig arrangement where um, the key holders are not the individual, <clears throat> which is how it is in collaborative custody and and, and multi sig in general. Um, but instead, we've partnered with institutions that that hold a key on each hold one key on behalf of that end client. So you have three institutions each holding one key. None you, none have unilateral control because they only have hold one key, and they all have a, a direct legal relationship with the end client, so, such that only the end client can direct the key holding institutions to sign on their behalf. So in that way, you have now removed a lot of the technical burden from setting up and maintaining your own multi-sig, um, which is daunting for any Bitcoiner, but you know a non-starter for a lot of not uh, less technical people. Um, and you have you know, best-in-class security because you've got multi-sig, fault tolerance built into that. W- you know, One of these three institutions could go under and you'd be fine because you can recover the, the, those assets using the other two keys. Um, none of those you know, institutions have unilateral control. And, and now we're imp- implementing and rolling out um, multi-jurisdictional, multi-institution, multi-sig custody. So you know, that, that means that these key holding institutions are in different countries. So y- you've kind of removed that, that's, that slight nagging um, Risk of uh, what if you know the U.S. government was to say, "All right, all right, um, all all of you key holders have to hand over your keys today." Well, that solves for that. It kind of becomes the holy grail of uh, of Bitcoin custody, in our view, where you know you you see an end there. There's now an end state emerging of um, distributed risk with fault tolerance across d- jurisdictions. Uh, and geographies, which you know, becomes effectively impossible for any sort of bad actor to to uh, uh, either perform a, a man in the middle attack, or um, you know, the, a, a common problem right now with people who store their coins on their exchanges is these social engineering hackers convince those people to hand over their credentials to log in, and then. And then their funds get swept. Um, you know, all that, all those risks get removed. The wrench attack risk gets removed for the individual because they're no longer holding their keys. They have hired institutions holding their keys on on their behalf. So anyway, that's that's what I've been spending most of my time on. We're very excited about it. You, you can, if you're interested in, in to your audience, if you guys um, are interested in that, check out onrampbitcoin.com. And you can schedule a consultation and and uh, talk with us about this concept if you're even vaguely interested in in how you know for a lot of our clients they have a self custody set up and they um, move a portion of their assets into on ramps multi institution custody as a way to diversify the risk so that you don't have all your eggs in one basket so you know if you're interested in talking about that um, give us a holler amazing uh, i think uh, it's it's like I love everyone that is innovating and is uh, developing in any way, shape, or form self custody. <laughs> like, yeah. uh, and and multi institutional uh, self custody is also self custody. Like, like it, right at the end of the day, it like, is because yeah. you're not giving your you're not giving your coins to any institution. It, you're, you still retain control. I think that's the important. It's it's not a self custody setup. <clears throat> But it's not a third custody, third party custody setup. Um, but ultimately, you retain control of your coins, so that's the the essence of self custody. Ultimately, is you have control. 
Absolutely, 100% agreed. As we are now close to the end of the podcast, I have one question that is always the same question for every guest. Um, what can we learn from you besides all the things that we already talked about? Interesting. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure what you can learn from me. Um, what I, what I have done is, you know, I've been putting out Bitcoin educational content for years now. Um, and I've assembled a, like a compendium of all my best, um, uh, graphics and bits of analysis and articles uh into a tweet thread that's sitting at the top of my uh, twitter page um so if you're interested in seeing my analysis over the years or uh you know reading some of my articles like why the yuppie elite dismissed bitcoin or bitcoin in the american west which uh, are probably my two other big ones that we didn't that that people seem to like a lot uh, besides the full potential valuation Uh, you can go check those out um, via my uh, the, the tweet that's pinned at the top of my uh, Twitter page, which is um, at Croesus, C-R-O-E-S-U-S underscore BTC. Uh, that's my Twitter handle. You can find it all there. Amazing. Perfect. And uh, thank you so much for, for uh, being all already. Uh, one thing, uh, we have an end routine where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. Uh, and your question is an interesting one. How long did it take you to understand uh, Bitcoin? Yeah, a while. Um, I went through the the way of pain. Uh, I I got into uh, Ethereum in 2016, and uh, then when that started doing well in 2017, I went down the altcoin path, and I you know went into all sorts of altcoin stuff. Uh, got murdered in 2018 you know, very humbling, uh, very, very painful experience. And then, uh, was forced to try to figure out what I was missing. Um, so early 2019, I started accepting the Bitcoin maximalist point of view and digging deeper into all of the literature around that. And like for most Bitcoin maximalists, I had like a six month period of of uh of manic zeal uh, as as i realized that this was the answer to everything um and so you know from the time i got into crypto until the time i fully under you know i, I got to the bitcoin maximalist uh, point of view was four years which i think it it's easier to bypass that now i think it's easier to get there quicker now but but i think it's it's also probably going to remain the the, the mode i suppose the most common um number of years that it takes to fully understand bitcoin it's interesting for, for me it's also four years uh it yeah, took me go. three years three years to first buy it from when I first heard it and then one year to actually fully understand it and go all in. Uh, perfect. And yeah, thank you so much uh, for being on. You already mentioned your Twitter. Is that the best way to, to reach out to you? Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the best one. Uh, at crisis underscore BTC. Perfect. And thank you so much for taking your time and being on. Also, thank you so much for everyone watching and listening as always. Uh, I'll be back tomorrow uh, with another episode. Bye-bye.